On this World Refugee Day, grim numbers from the United Nations as the number of globally displaced reaches an all-time high. The new Yoruba king discusses the role of traditional leaders in modern Nigeria. And is this new technology the future of gaming? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Monday is World Refugee Day, and a new report says worldwide forced displacement last year reached record-breaking levels. The United Nations Refugee Agency's Global Trends Report finds conflict and persecution triggered a sharp escalation in refugees and internally displaced people in 2015. 65 million people were forcibly, forcibly displaced last year, an increase of nearly 5 million over the previous year. The UN agency says more people now are being displaced by war and persecution. This at a time when a growing number of countries are closing their borders to asylum seekers. Percent of the forcibly displaced are displaced in poor or middle income countries, not in the rich world. Contrary to the perception that most people certainly in the rich world have. 50% of the refugees come from eight countries. These are the countries that we usually call major host countries, countries like Kenya or like uh, Pakistan or like uh, Ethiopia and so forth. And 50% of the refugees are children. Now, for more perspective on this growing global refugee crisis, Joe Milman, spokesman for the International Organization for Migration, joins me live via Skype from Geneva, Switzerland. Hi, Joe. Joe? Do you hear me? I'm Joe. getting Chinese audio. Joe Milman, looks like we are not communicating. Okay, probably we'll come back to him. In a short while, we're trying to connect with Joe Milman, a spokesperson of the International Organization of Migration in Geneva. But let's go back uh, to Africa now. In East Africa, five police officers were killed Monday during an attack in, the northeastern, in northeastern Kenya. Somalia's Al-Shabaab terrorist group says it is responsible for the latest deadly incursion aimed at punishing Kenya for sending troops to Somalia. Al-Shabaab military operations spokesman Shahabu Musab told Reuters four officers were also wounded and a vehicle in their convoy was burned in the ambush by its fighters. Now, diplomats say Kenya's northeastern border with Somalia is a security weak spot given the challenge of policing a long frontier, poor coordination between security services and a culture of corruption that allows those prepared to pay a bribe to pass unchallenged. Now, a documentary about body removal teams in Liberia during the Ebola outbreak was recently screened at the American Film Institute Festival in Silver Spring, Maryland. Now, viewers Caroline Turner tells us more about it. Body Team 12 is a documentary about the Red Cross workers who collected the dead during the height of the Ebola outbreak in Liberia. What sort of sickness is this? The story is told by Garmai Sumil, a nurse who worked during the epidemic. The film was directed by David Darb. When I first got to Liberia, I was helping shoot all sorts of content to help raise funds and raise awareness about the Ebola epidemic, and that included following doctors and medical personnel people that were doing incredible work. Um, but it wasn't until I met Garmai, the central character of Body Team 12 and the Body Team, that I really decided that that was the focus of the story I wanted to tell of Ebola. That of all the people I met, these were the bravest uh, young Liberians that are uh, just doing unimaginable work. Uh, and I wanted to capture that on film as a tribute to their bravery. Everywhere. The body collectors had a dangerous and gruesome job, and they quickly became outcasts in the community. You see your father, your brother, your sister just die like that. One day, history will look back and ask, what did we do to help Liberia? I am not today, and nothing is going to make me to be discouraged. I'm going to work. Not only were these body team workers uh, facing unimaginable dangers every day, coming in close proximity to Ebola. 
uh, as well as the families of the victims angry at them for taking away the dead loved ones. Just very stressful work. They, has, they had also been excommunicated from their communities because people, because of the stigma of Ebola, their neighbors wanted to have nothing to do with them. Their, even their own families disowned them during the outbreak. The film captures the heartbreaking bravery of the workers to prevent the transmission of the disease. So Ebola leave my country, I am going to work. So the goal of the film is, is several fold, but we wanted it to be a tribute to the bravery of these young Liberians that were doing everything they could to save their country and ultimately save all of us from what could have been a far worse Ebola outbreak. So it's a, it's a story about heroes. Um, you know, when these crises happen around the world, no matter what it is, you have humans that rise to the forefront and emerge as heroes, and that's what this film's about. The film was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary Short Subject, and it won at the Tribeca Film Festival. The film is now used as a tool to show what the world has learned from the Ebola pandemic and how to better handle it in the future. Carolyn Turner, VOA News. Well, we go back to a top story, the World Refugee Day, and we want to connect now to get some perspective on the growing ref uh, global refugee crisis uh, with Joe Millman of the International Organization of Migration. Joe, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you. Now, first, one of the things that hits you when you listen to the UNHCR report is the sheer numbers. Uh, are things only getting grimmer and grimmer by the year? I hate to look at it that way. Uh, the numbers are going up, that's true. Uh, we have a, a human phenomenon of, of great mobility all over the world right now. It's difficult to simply say all of it's distressed. In fact, most of it probably isn't. Internal migration in emerging economies is also a huge mover of people right now. Uh, what seems to be the biggest challenge right now is getting different sectors of the world or different uh, lobes, let's say, of the globe to assimilate, to understand that this is a long-term marriage between the jobless South and the job-rich North, a job-rich North that's aging terribly quickly and is going to need young people and young, young workers you know, to fill uh, state coffers and deliver the kind of financing that, that these governments have promised their elderly citizens. So we know there's a long-term solution. We're just waiting for the world to, to embrace it and understand this is the management we have to work towards. Now, again, one of the biggest challenges is that uh, how you deal with people who are in refugee camps and those who are displaced from their homes but are not in refugee camps, right? Well, yes. I mean, you have a, a compounded issue right now, which is the, excess of, uh, the accessibility of technology. Uh, in, in my youth, you know, 30 years ago, a refugee was isolated. He was unable to, to know if he even had any kind of options to go home, to go to a third country, to, to improve his situation where he is. Today, with so much technology literally at people's fingertips, they, they're getting solutions and they're hearing about them. And they, they find that it's within their capacity quite often to change their lives right where they are. So they're moving either, either out of the camps and into the society of the, of the host country or, or much further, thousands of miles away. They have access to financing. They hear about know-how. They network with their peers. And they know how to get on the move and change their lives in a matter of months. And this is really unstoppable. It's a good thing for a migrant to know that he has options, but it's, it's terrifying for, for planners, let's say, for governments that, that want stability and want predictability. And now it's a world that's not so predictable. Yeah. Now, we know a continent like Africa has a great burden of refugees. Uh, is it getting the kind of help it, it, it requires, it needs, or what's the situation, briefly? Well, I mean, what's the situation for our whole continent is not a brief answer. Uh, we think that there are, there are solutions close to home. We would love to see Africa, like Europe, have sort of a border-free zone within, its, within various regions. You know, migrants don't necessarily want to get on flimsy boats and risk their lives in the Mediterranean. If there's a good job two countries away, they, they'd love to be able to go there legally and, and have uh, permission to work. Uh, mm -hmm. So we think that's a solution that, that will come soon and that yeah. Africa will embrace. Well, Joel, thank you very much for your insight. Pleasure, for, pleasure yeah. Vincent. Thank you. Well, Joel Millman is the spokesman for the International Organization for Migration, speaking to us live via Skype from Geneva. Now, one week after the massacre at a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, the U.S. Senate is expected to vote on a series of proposals to block gun sales to terrorist suspects and expand screening of people buying firearms in the United States. But as VOA's Michael Bowman reports, 
it is not clear that any gun control measure can pass a Republican majority Congress. Church bells tolled in Orlando precisely one week after Omar Mateen began shooting at Pulse nightclub. By day, grieving families are laying victims to rest. We've done nothing, nothing at all. I've had enough of the ongoing slaughter of innocents, and I've had enough of inaction in this body. Democrats commandeered the Senate floor for 15 hours, demanding votes on long-stalled legislation to curb gun violence. Enough, enough, enough. We cannot go on with business as usual in this body. Republicans insist a focus on gun control is misguided. We need a strategy to defeat uh, ISIS, which is the inspiration for these homegrown attacks here at home. But Republicans agreed to allow votes later Monday. We got a commitment from the Republicans to bring two measures to the floor of the Senate for a vote, one that expands out the number of background checks that are conducted, and the second that keeps terrorists uh, off of the list of people who can buy guns. Votes are also expected on Republican alternatives that spell out the rights of gun owners. We don't want terrorists to be able to walk in to a gun store and buy a gun. And we don't want an innocent law-abiding citizen to be denied his Second Amendment rights because he's wrongly on the list with a bunch of terrorists. This is not rocket science. Senate action on gun control is considered unlikely, House action even more so. Is going after the Second Amendment how you stop terrorism? No, that's not how you stop terrorism. That view is echoed by America's biggest gun rights lobby. This notion that more gun control is going to prevent some jihadist who thinks that he's going to obtain martyrdom by murdering innocent people really gets away from the serious nature of the problem that we're facing. We want to make sure that terrorists don't have access to firearms. In Orlando last week, a presidential plea to overcome political divides. I held and hugged grieving family members and parents, and they asked, why does this keep happening? And they pleaded that we do more to stop the carnage. They don't care about the politics. Democrats and Republicans both fear the Orlando attack will not be America's last mass shooting. For now, that is where bipartisanship ends. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, new king of Ile Ife of the Yoruba people on blending traditional roles with modernity in Nigeria. Stay with us. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. U.S. President Barack Obama is warning the negative effects of climate change are already visible in the country's first protected public land, and he is calling for more effort to protect nature for future generations. Mr. Obama addressed the need for conservation during a weekend visit to Yosemite Park, a 300,000-hectare national park in central California. Viewers Zlady Tsahok reports. Yosemite Park attracts close to 4 million visitors a year with its evergreen woodlands, waterfalls, valleys, and diverse animal life. The president interrupted a weekend trip with his family to warn that climate change is not just a threat, but a reality. I was talking to some of the rangers here. Here in Yosemite, meadows are drying up. Bird ranges are shifting 
farther northward. Alpine mammals like uh, pikas are being forced further upslope to escape higher temperatures. Yosemite's largest glacier, once a mile wide, is now almost gone. Obama has used his authority to protect more than 100 million hectares of land and water from development. He has also established the first ever national carbon pollution standards for power plants, a large source of carbon pollution. But his plan to reduce carbon emissions by 30% from its 2005 levels in the next decade or so has met with resistance in states that depend on coal mining, such as Kentucky. Companies that sell mining equipment and others linked to the coal industry also are concerned. We'll just be outsourced. You know, other places that are locally that are trying to, to do business here that don't have a global reach like we do, it's going to be increasingly difficult for them to try and keep up. Meanwhile, some environmentalists in Europe criticize the United States for perpetuating the world's pollution problem by exporting its coal to other countries. U.S. coal exports to Germany have more than doubled since 2008, providing a cheaper alternative to natural gas and a replacement for nuclear power, which is being phased out. American coal plays a relatively big role on the European coal market because it is interesting with regards to price, since the U.S. doesn't use so much coal anymore because of their use of shale gas. The United States this year marks the 100th anniversary of its National Park Service, a system that includes more than 400 outdoor sites throughout the country. Zlatica Hoke, VOA News, Washington. Well, the new king of Ila Ife of the Yoruba people, King Adeyeye Enitan Ogunsi, is now one of the most influential among the Yoruba people, Nigeria's second biggest ethnic group of about 35 million in West Africa. He discussed with me the role of traditional leaders in modern democratic Nigeria. To the glory of God, I'm opportune to be the king of Ife. Ife is an ancient kingdom that our progenitor came from, our progenitor Odudua, that actually gave rise to the entire Yoruba kingdom, um, spread across the entire territory of the Yoruba kingdom, and pretty much we still keep our heritage and our values. So for kingship system, it has been in existence way before colonization. Now we know that colonization came and uh, completely configured systems across the continent of Africa. What impact has it had in Nigeria and uh, say particularly in your region among the Yoruba people? How did that change the dynamics on how you govern, how you rule uh, the traditional kingships? Well, if you look at it from a positive perspective, um, it has actually changed us in terms of modernization and civilization. Although civilization has been proven started from Ileife, it's been proven. And uh, because by virtue of tracing it to our artifacts, um, the Bronze Age actually started from horse. Then the Stone Age, we played a very active role compared to the likes of Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire, Greek Empire, when they realized when the Europeans came and they saw the handiwork work of the ancient Ife indigents and they compared it with other kingdoms. They realized that ours are much more older and superior. So my point is the modernization in terms of uh, colonization that came in made us to lose some of our core values in Africa. And um, it should have been blended properly together. It's not very good to forget your source. Any time you forget your source, it's always a problem. Now, in a country like Nigeria, where is a consequence of colonialism, they came and created this uh, countries, which was amalgamation of the different uh, uh, ethnic city and ethnic groups across the region. They drew a line and made it a country. Now you have a central government, the federal government. What is the role of a traditional king, say you, in Nigeria? Constitutionally, we don't have a role. But at some point, even creation of a country in Nigeria, the traditional rulers played a very active role. So my point is, the traditional rulers have been playing active role. 
from 1914 all the way till our independence in 1960. And in 1960, the Constitution of Nigeria actually gave very strong recommendation for the traditional rulers. But up till today, any time our political leaders want to get to government, they usually carry the, the, the traditional rulers along. They come to meet them so that they talk to their people because they are closer to the people because every day the communities converge and they go to their traditional rulers. It is still a very revert position till tomorrow in Nigeria. So it's still relevant. Yes. We know that um, one of the challenges in Nigeria faces and many other African countries is uh, uh, some of the ills in society, including corruption. Uh, there is, of course, uh, violence in some communities. How much influence do you have as traditional rulers to rein in some of these things or to help people, uh, you know, live uh, in line with uh, some of the desired values? like honesty, you know, good governance, and so on and so forth. It is resided in the traditional rulership system. You can't take away that fact. We need to go back to our source because it is traditional rulers that know almost everybody within the community. It is traditional rulers that will know when strangers come in. It is traditional rulers that will know a particular family that is not towing the line of morals and normal ethics. We Africans, the way it's been structured, we have been structured through the kingship system, the, the, the system of monarchy. It's very common across all African countries. However, in recent times, the, 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 the role of traditional rulers hasn't been very, very felt. So my point is, the proponents and the major preacher for morals and values are the traditional rulers. They are there for a longer period compared to um, the leaders, political leaders. We need to work closely together, both traditional rulers and political leaders. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Can augmented reality games win over virtual reality enthusiasts? We'll be right back. against persons with albinism for the purposes of taking their body parts for sale. Right today. Let's see, let's see. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. While virtual reality took center stage at this year's Electronic Entertainment Expo, a small group of exhibitors are banking on how augmented reality, or AR, is transforming gameplay into the real world. Augmented reality can overlay the real world with information, avatars, or user interfaces. Location-based games challenge players to explore the real world using their mobile devices to discover and capture mysterious sources of energy. Players must form alliances with local gamers in order to succeed. Well, next up, a humanoid robot that can speak 19 languages is being welcomed at a hospital in Belgium as its newest member of staff. Designed with a special software which can be used on any device with a web access, Pepper will from now on introduce visitors to the hospital, provide information and guide visitors or patients to their desired floor and room. 
With a speed of just three kilometers per hour, Pepper is also able to guide the slower patients. Uh, when fully charged, Pepper can work for up to 20 hours on its own. Well, and finally, a Canadian tour company has taken people's love of fast cars to the ultimate level in sports adventures. Customers get to explore the spectacular natural beauty of the Vancouver coastline while fulfilling a lifelong dream of driving luxury sports cars. This impressive selection includes a Lamborghini, an Audi Quattro, a Ferrari, and the Corvair Z06, which sends drivers from zero to 60 miles per hour in three and a half seconds. The adrenaline fueled tours are the brainchild of two local entrepreneurs who found inspiration from their own exotic driving experience through Red Rock Canyon in Las Vegas. The tour. The tours are seasonal and run between April until late October. And that is what is trending today. What well, is sports news? Finally, the Cleveland Cavaliers are world champions, ending a decades of sports outbreak in the city by beating the Golden State Warriors 93 to 89 Sunday night in the deciding seventh game of the National Basketball Association Finals. Superstar LeBron James led the Cavaliers with 27 points, 11 assists, and 11 rebounds. Cleveland came back from a three games to one deficit to the Warriors to win the title, the first team in NBA history to accomplish the feat. The championship is the Cavaliers' first in its history and breaks a 52-year title drought for the city of Cleveland. You know, right now it's just excitement. You know, it's not even relief. It's just excitement for us as a team, as a franchise, as a city, as a community. Um, you know, to be able to continue to build up our city, uh, continue to be an uh, inspiration to our city, it, it means everything. And I'm happy to be a part of James, it. James, who was named the series' most valuable player, grew up in nearby Akron, Ohio. He was drafted by the team when he entered the league in 2003, but left on bad terms to sign with the Miami Heat in 2010, where he won two championships. He returned to Cleveland last season, promising to finally win a championship for his beloved city. Golden State was trying to cap what was a historic season of their own. After winning a record-setting 73 regular season games, one better than the 1995-96 Chicago Bulls, led by the great Michael Jordan. What a victory there. And that's our show for today. Thanks a lot uh, for watching. Just be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight, at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us here in Washington. Have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here's a word you might have heard in medical stories. Chemotherapy. Until recently, the treatment all patients received was the same chemotherapy. Sometimes it helped, but sometimes it didn't. Researchers have been trying to come up with better treatments to shrink the tumors without affecting normal tissue or subjecting patients to the negative side effects of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is medicine used by doctors to fight cancer and some mental disorders. Chemotherapy uses chemicals to kill cancer cells in a person's body. The chemicals sometimes are mixed in a liquid and injected into a person's blood. Now when you hear the word chemotherapy, you will know what this news word means.